Hey everyone, it is January 15, 2014, and right now we're going to be talking to Paul Kent about Macworld iWorld Expo. <music> Joining me as always is the managing editor of iMore, Mr. Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? Hi, Renee. I'm good. How are you? That is a lovely shirt, sir. Thank you. Also joining me, I am thrilled to announce we have, I, I don't know what your official title is, I'm going to call you Head Honcho of <laughs> Macworld iWorld Expo, Paul Kent. How are you, Paul? I'm doing great, Renee, and that is a lovely hoodie you're wearing. Thank you. This is, I, I got this uh, the day before I met you in San Francisco at Pete's Coffee. I got this from the mothership. <laughs> Whenever I'm in the area, I try to check out the latest fashions uh, from Apple. They have more than just black and white colors now, I guess. Yeah, and like the most amazing t-shirt ever. They're getting almost witty. It's interesting. It's like a metamorphosis. So, Paul, I mean, people are... Macworld is an incredibly long-running show. Um, it is incredibly famous. Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone at Macworld. Um, probably the greatest keynote from the greatest keynote deliverer of all time. Uh, you have an incredible legacy. Can you tell me a little bit about just the history of Macworld to bring us up to speed? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the story of Macworld is actually quite interesting. You know, Macworld, this is the 30th year of Macworld, and many of your listeners will note that this is also the 30th year that there's been a Mac, and that's not a coincidence. Um, Macworld Trade Show and Macworld the Magazine were actually part of the original Mac rollout things. I mean, you know, it was a relationship between Apple and IDG at, at the launch of, of the original Mac um, that, that led there to be created. You know, there was this new computer coming out and there was not really a, an industry surrounding around it. And so IDG, you know, is essentially the largest technology publishing company in the world. Um, the partnership started back then in, in 1984. The first show was in 1985. And uh, we were there uh, as part of the launch activities for the original Mac. And so, you know, this 30-year history has been really fantastic. I mean, the early enthusiasm. And I actually think one of the great things about Macworld that has really sustained it over the years is Macworld was probably the first big trade event that created this sense of community, the sense of feeling, the sense of people wanting to be, you know, looking forward to seeing each other and then keeping in touch throughout the year. So in the 80s, you know, Macworld was, was uh, you know, very much this fan fest environment as this in nascent industry was starting to grow. Um, and then in the 90s, as things got, you know, a little bit difficult in the, in the Apple products industry, Macworld still was sustaining. I mean, they were still very large shows, 30, 40, 50,000 attendees. You know, whatever developers were coming to the platform were certainly there. And then, of course, you know, when Steve Jobs came back with the very, very well-known um, uh, appearance at Macworld in Boston in 1997, and that began, you know, the ascension that we've been on, you know, even to today in this, in this industry that we're all a part of. And so um, that's the 30-year history. Apple, of course, you know, about four years ago made the announcement that they're not going to be participating in anybody's trade shows anymore. They don't do the NAM show, they don't do the NAB show, you know, they certainly don't do CES. And so we've been carrying on the show for the last four years um, as uh, an answer to what do I do after I walk out of an Apple store? I have bought my Mac, my iPad, my iPhone. Now how do I learn to use it better and what cool things can I find to make the experience of using it better? And and it's been very successful. We've, we've um, added a lot of creative and cultural events to the show. We have musical performances, we have art galleries, we have um, we have uh, videography events, we have a film festival. So we've had all these kind of very, very interesting things that have gone on over the past years, and it's taken a different role, but again, 30 years later, events morph to the industry that they're serving, and uh, we're really happy with where it is right now. We've been open, you know, we started our alumni registration um, in the beginning of, of, uh, of December, and the people who have been coming years and years and years certainly have signed up. We have this great foundation of attendees, about 15,000 people already signed up, and you know now we have, still have two and a half more months before the show, which is at the end of March this year for the first time uh, that we deliver the show, uh, March 27th to 29th. So I mean I'm eager to hear Peter's thoughts on this, but I I'm amazed. My first MacWorld, my first show I ever covered was MacWorld, so it was sort of my initiation into this, and I got that immediate sense. I saw people walking around there who had been there from the beginning, from the first Mac, and I saw people who were you know had had just bought their first iPhone, and the incredible gamut of people it covered, and the incredible amount of products it showcased. 
Uh, and more than that, I think that, that year I took the Final Cut Pro course at Macworld, and that's how I learned how to use Final Cut Pro. Um, and the experience really was that community. It's for someone who was unfamiliar with Apple products, unfamiliar with them. It was su basically summer camp for for uh, anyone who loved Apple stuff. Peter, do you remember your... I mean, you've been covering Macworld way longer than I have. Yeah, but my first Macworld Expo, I think I was an attendee. I don't think that I was actually affiliated with 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 anything yet. Um, I mean, I've been writing about the Mac for, you know, 20 years now, but um, before that, my, my, my career has always been sort of, you know, sort of somewhere in the, the, the Apple universe. So... Um, as, as a user, I was immensely interested, and of course, Macworld Expo used to happen in Boston, which is my hometown, so I would take time off from work, and I would head down to the show, and um, uh, my interest in, in doing it was actually talking to the people who um, develop the products that I was using every day or that I was really interested in, and uh, one of the things that's unique, I think, about Macworld Expo is that... Um, not only is it a great learning experience, not only is it a great cultural experience, but it enables you to con to connect with um, the the people who um, make the products that you use in a really unique um, way and in a very personal way uh, that that gives you a very different perspective on what you're doing. So that was what drew me to it originally. But what kept me coming back was. Every year there was something new to learn. Every year there was uh, a new event to go to that interested me. And that, you know, through the 30 years the, of the, the show's history, hasn't changed. Although the show today is very, very different than it was from my first event or, you know, even the, the uh, a one that you might go to five or six years ago, that um, metamorphosis is sort of a constant theme in Macworld Expo. And that's why it's as relevant today as it was 30 years ago. I, I really appreciate you saying that, you know, Peter, and it's a really interesting thing. I'm thinking about the conversation that you and I had, Renee, over coffee in Palo Alto, and we were talking about this sense of community, you know, who is the, the, the Apple community and the Apple enthusiasts now, and I think a lot about, Peter, you know, the posts that you've been putting out lately about what you learned working in an Apple store, right? It is, it is Macworld, iWorld's goal to, to continue to be a value to those people who have trusted it and relied on it for finding new products and learning things for, for the past 30 years. And we have a lot of people who've come for most of those 30 years. But the audience and the world is changing so much. And what an event can offer an 18-year-old or a 25-year-old now that didn't grow up with that passion of being there you know, as the, as the Mac was launched or as the industry was created or as that community took place. They're very, very different people. So we're kind of, you know, working really hard to have the show satisfy the needs of the longtime attendee, but also appeal to this new uh, type of user, where passion for Apple products is is a a slightly, uh, actually a a, 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 a significantly um, different experience than those of us who've been around for almost as long as the platform has. You know that that's a that that presents an interesting question that, that I'd like to get your take on, Paul. How do you, uh, you know, given the spectrum of Apple users today, because Apple users are, are no longer a, a small little niche, right? We're not just Mac users who think that our platform is better than Windows. We're, we're you know, we're iPhone users, we're iPad users, and it's, Apple has transformed itself into a consumer electronics company as opposed to just a computer company. Um, how does that change how you try to reach the audience that you're trying to reach to? Um, because they may not self-identify as Apple enthusiasts um, the same way that people of previous generations who have gone to Macworld Expos have. You, you really nailed the essence of it. And, and the answer is um, we look at it from an event perspective. What's interesting? You're asking kind of a marketing question. And so, you know, the, the outreaches are now you know, significantly more through social media, but also the way that we design the show. And a lot of the features that I described before, you know, last year we held a battle of the bands inviting any musical groups across the country who use Apple technology in their performance or recording could enter. And this wonderful group called Exist Elsewhere uh, out of Southern California won the competition. Um, uh, and they have a huge fan base. 
and they point to Macworld as one of their you know launching points for their career, um, the winning of our of our uh, Battle of the Bands contest. So you do interesting things like that. It, you know, events you, you might hear. Um, the term experiential, you know, it, it's different than just walking the aisles for products and sitting in a, in a classroom. It's much more communal. It's much more meetup oriented. It's and more need, human in my experience. I, I think that that's where it has to get to. I mean, and, and that's just, uh, that's an event I issue and I think that's a user, it, it's defined on users. And so, um, you know, we're trying to, do, to create events that appeal in that way and that um, feel comfortable to both the long-term users and these new people who self-identify as they like Apple products, but they may not be that same type of rabid enthusiast for anything that Apple does. Our sweet spot is, is you know, our sweet spot is probably the person who's pretty darn passionate about using Apple technology, but it's not everything that they do all the day. I mean, we, you have the same challenge with Macworld, iWorld that I think we have with iMore, and that's the sheer scope of Apple's audience these days. Absolutely. They're not, to Peter's point, a niche underdog computer company. They're massively mainstream. We're not even sure half of them are on the web to begin with, to like you know to even find uh, events or or websites. There's the hardcore, you know ultra geek who who hacks everything but there's my mom who's just you know learning how to use the iPad and it makes for an incredibly large audience but an incredibly segmented one at the same time I would agree and, and a couple thoughts there is one is um, the audience is a little bit broader in their interests and so you see our content start to evolve where the essence of our conference content that people pay for is you know diving deep into the secrets of Siri and the secrets of iCloud the session that you're doing Renee and you have all the Macworld editors kind of taking some of the features of the Macworld publications and bring them to life but one of the keynotes that we've announced already is is Robert Scoville and Shel Israel who are the authors of this book The Age of Context this is not a Mac specific issue it's certainly there are there are um, Issues of specific uh, importance and concern to Apple issue to Apple users, but it's a broader. It's it's a technology enthusiast audience, and that's really you know that defines that new kind of kind of customer. If they if they want to come to the show, they're pretty invested in a Apple technology first, but b um, the world of technology around them. And remember, there's not a lot of places where an average consumer can go to a trade show anymore or a conference or a convention. Most of them are kind of industry events. We are populous. We're open to the yeah. public. We want you know anyone who enjoys this, this technology to come, and that's well, the energy and vibrancy of the show. CES will tell you that if you're not a journalist or a buyer or something or an industry person, you just you can't get in. I mean, that's that's right on the front place. And I think you make a very valid point. You could easily have a PC on your desk, an iPhone in your pocket, and your email coming through Google. It's not the same days where you were a single platform. Like I am all Microsoft. I am all Apple. But that also gives you an opportunity to reach out to those people and show them the value of what you mentioned of iCloud, of Siri. I would think it's safe to say that you know people maybe only use 5% of the stuff that Apple provides, of any vendor provides. And for me, it wasn't just the expo part, but the educational stuff you do, and even the entertainment stuff, like seeing the Macworld guys doing a podcast live on the stage. It just, it makes everything seem, like, it makes me think I can do more with what I have. I agree. It's it's filling in the blanks. Like I said, what do I do now that I've walked out of an Apple store? And you know, it's funny. You could argue that the conference is actually more relevant now because there is more features that are a little bit more mundane to put to work, you know, than than in the past. And you know, as easy as it's gotten to use a lot of these things, there's so much power on their hood. But you know, we don't talk a lot about the nuances of iCloud, and we don't talk a lot about you know the nuances of uh, you know connecting Exchange uh, servers to Apple Mail, those types of things. So Macworld is a good place where people get those answers. Peter, uh, we're we're both scheduled to go this year. Uh, we will walk the floor. We will look at the cases. But I think, at least in my experience from the last few years, and I, I wrote this up uh, last year or the year before, was that. More than ever now, this feels like my Mac world. It feels like I can tailor the event to my specific interests. Yeah, I have the uh, the same sense. You know, looking over the uh, the the uh, the show's website uh, at macworldiworld.com, um, the 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 content that's on there. There's there's stuff each day that's really well suited for uh, for people, no matter what their interests are. Um, as far as that's concerned, Paul. How do you put together 
the agenda for a show like this? What does it take to sort of gather up the um, uh, the, the expertise for the people who are talking and, uh, and, and get them all sort of uh, working on, off the same page? Got it. So um, there's a couple answers to that. We do an open call for ideas where anybody can submit what they're doing. We give some guidelines. We're looking for people who are doing state-of-the-art implementations of putting Apple technology to work. And, you know, we get a couple hundred submissions. And then we work closely with um, two groups. We have an industry advisory council. Renee is on the industry advisory council, actually. And then we also have an editorial advisory council, which is essentially the Macworld editors. And they give us feedback. Both groups give us feedback about uh, things that should go on. And that you know, generates a good component of the, of the content. But at the end of the day, after that, it's really kind of up to us to know what things are important to people. So, you know, all the time we're talking to editors, we're talking to users, we're talking to customers, we're observing the things of interest in the industry. Um, and so we fill in the blank. So, you know, people push to us probably about 60% of the ideas, you know, that ultimately end up part of the agenda. And then we go out and recruit and pull in about 40% of the speakers based upon the topics we know that are important. And that's how the conference stays relevant. So you've got some uh, familiar faces for people who are, you know, familiar with the Mac blogosphere. You know, everybody from uh, uh, Dan Frakes uh, from MacWorld uh, to uh, um, uh, familiar folks like the uh, John Gruber is the yeah. right, exactly. But then you've got some uh, some really unusual ones too, like uh, Berkeley College of Music and uh, um, and. Uh, 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 what, what are some of the other ones that I'm thinking of? Like uh, um, Hoboken Public Schools, Hawaii Prep Academy. Uh, obviously, I, uh, iOS products and Mac products and education, very important segment. Um, is, is that a response to uh, requests that you've gotten from previous attendees saying, I want more like this? We, we evaluate every speaker every year, and um, we survey our users all the time. And so good ideas can come from anywhere. I mean, sometimes it's a particularly fantastic speaker that we've come across. We work with, you, you talked about Hawaii Prep Academy. So the presenter from Hawaii Prep Academy is Dr. Bill Wicking. He's a Ph.D. physicist who teaches at this private high school on the big island of Hawaii. And the first year that we brought him, because he was an Apple Distinguished Educator, he blew people away, and you know, Bill's become a regular part of our faculty because you know it's that it's that line of really, really smart and really good presenter. There's a lot of people who are really smart, but you can't put them on stage. There's a lot of people who are entertaining, but are not, you know, it's all show and no con and and uh, no content. So we look for the intersection of those two lines as what it would make a good presenter. And when we find somebody, we tend to use them over again. But we always, you know, we'll, we'll have a certain percentage of the show each year that we refresh and, and uh, get some new faces in. I'm curious about what Paul's Macworld is, because I know you're a music lover. You play up on stage every year, uh, and I know you're not allowed picking favorites, but are there certain elements or certain parts of Macworld that just make you smile more, or you become a giant fan and forget you're the organizer? Um, it, it's a little of both, and, and it, I, I really appreciate the question, and the absolute honest answer is, you know, I've been... Um, involved with Macworld since 1996, 97, excuse me. And, uh, I, you know, I'd just taken uh, the role right after that Steve Jobs, um, you know, presentation. So I've been around the show for a long time. And, you know, I, like many of us, you know, Peter, I think this would, this would uh, account for you as well. I've grown up in this industry. I have lifelong professional contacts. I, I would, you know, not hesitate to call them friends. Um, and getting to see them every year, in general, the feedback is always constructive. They care about Macworld, and it's been an honor and a privilege to be a caretaker of this thing that means so much to people. We've had our ups and downs over the years. The show has changed over the years. But in general, people really appreciate what Macworld offers to them. And to have been able to have you know, been kind of the steward to, to guide it through the different uh, transformations of the last several years, I mean, being able to be a part of the iPhone rollout was an amazing, you know, professional moment. Uh, but the answer to your question is, it's really, you know, I work all year on this, and then to see the, the people that I build it for and to know that they're enjoying it is really particularly valuable. So that's that's a soft and gushy answer, but that's the <laughs> first answer. And then after that, you know, I still enjoy auditing the classes myself and learning new things. Um, I like, uh, you know, that we're bringing 
developers a nice audience of new people to show their products to. I mean, that's a really particularly exciting about it. The, the makeup of the type of people who exhibit at the show is much different now. A lot of them are companies, emerging companies coming to market. We put a real emphasis on getting app developers to come to the show. And so, you know, we'll have as many as 150 app developers at the show. You don't get to go talk to the guy who developed a product in very many places. You don't get to kind of be in ground central of the greatest app developers in the world all in one place at one time. And there's a certain energy to that as well. So I guess everything I'm saying to you is, you know, building a show that has meaning and then getting the feedback that people enjoy the show, you know, is very, very um, gratifying to me. When people let us know what they don't like about the show, you know, when you work all, we put a lot of passion into it. Um, when when we listen and we do our best to try and address things and and uh, and and make the show better all the time, but creating an audience for the developers and keeping that part of the industry vibrant and having a part of making that part of the industry vibrant is particularly useful. You know, I'm a conference guy. I've done conferences since uh, 1991 when I owned my own business that did an Apple industry conference. Um, I love activity. <laughs> righteous. Um, you know, I love that uh, that uh, you know bringing people together to learn is a very very. That's why I've been doing it for so long. So. Uh, the whole thing is just really gratifying to me. I love what I do, and that's why I've been doing it for so long. So there's a couple challenges, and I think, again, I, I find the challenges with Macworld very similar to challenges with iMore. I remember the time, like, for example, Apple doesn't really help out uh, media outlets the way that other companies who are much more outgoing do. So, you know, we can't rely on Apple to help us. Also, there used to be a time when I was the only one writing extensive guides, you know, to Apple stuff, and now all the mainstream publications, because Apple is so popular, are doing the same thing. And I think it's fair to say, you know, Macworld, iWorld used to have Apple at the event. Uh, used to be the only one showcasing Apple accessories and Apple developers, and now everybody wants to do that. So, um, how do you start handling a challenge of being, you know, where Apple's not the underdog anymore, you're not the only show, you know, you don't have the benefit of Steve Jobs on the stage, uh, you know, he's passed away. Uh, what does Macworld look like in that world? So you're asking what the value proposition, why should there be a Macworld iWorld, right? And, well, what you know, makes it unique in a world where everyone wants to be, have a piece of Apple? Um, I would say what makes it unique is the combination of activities, right? So again, you have education, you have product discovery, it's actually a very good shopping experience. Just about all of the exhibitors that are there offering some kind of a show special. So you can see something, get the immediate gratification of walking away with it, and usually for a better price than you normally would. Um, it's the community. It's it's the serendipitous, it's the serendipitous uh, meeting someone in a class or on the show floor or in one of the many circles on the floor of people showing their hacks or showing, you know, uh, helping each other out that turns into a coffee, that turns into a dinner. That's the value in a in a real world um, uh, event, different from what happens at a virtual event. So uh, that's the answer: is that as a physical event, um, it, it provides a multitude of touch points that have uh, have uh, connected value to making the experience worthwhile. Yeah, I would argue there's several things that I like. This is just me personally. I like that in previous years, I I had fellow journalists who would fly in just for the keynote and leave immediately thereafter, and there was no sense of community there. And I don't blame them. They're busy, but it's a different experience than what I want. Uh, you go to CES, and it's literally like matrix shelves of cases flying past you. Uh, it's too much to look at. You can't buy them if you like them because it's not a consumer event. Um, and it's it's just over the top. Macworld to me was an uh, even if I didn't work in media, I could go there and I could get a sense of Apple from it. It was literally a show for me and not for the industry or for you know X other group. Yeah, along those lines, there's two kind of interesting components. One is a lot of people in the industry attend Macworld in a different way now. Now, now, you know, from our conversations, which are pretty interesting. You find Macworld more accessible now that that some of the you know kind of you know people who are only there for Apple's Big Bang are, are moved through. I would say that there's a lot of buyers and there's a lot of industry watchers who come to the show and they kind of stand back and they see where the consumers are going, what booths are hot, as an indication of what products are hot. And you know those turn into corporate buying relationships or those turned into articles or those types of things. So that's one way that the event is different. Um, we put a lot of effort into the app developer culture and it's really important message in that this is how we intelligently architect the show this is you know we created it, most of the app developers are one man two man three man or small companies right they don't do trade shows they may not have full time marketing people they're you know a lot of them are more developer you know staff oriented that's where the money goes if they go to WWDC they don't see their customers 
That's right. And so what we did is we created a whole area of the show floor and created a way for app developers to just walk in with their iPhone or their iPad and be an official part of the show and be demonstrating. We, you know, and we, at price points that are very, very reasonable, and they don't have to know anything about trade shows, they don't have to do anything about you know, shipping things to convention centers and things like that. And I think that that's a little bit of the intelligent engineering we've done to keep the show relevant. So like I said, you have 150 app developers. That's critical mass of, of great app developers in one place at one time. You know, the, the amount of, um, you, you get venture capitalists walking to find out what products they, you know, companies they might want to invest in. You get um, people looking at each other for, you know, uh, stealing, borrowing, lending uh, a talent, right? So you get kind of a hiring pool type of thing going on. And then you get developers getting real world feedback on their apps, face to face, right, with the guy who wrote it. And that's of particular value. So. You know, the show has these unique new types of nuances that fill in the blanks different from when Apple was the center of the show. Paul, I've got a question for you, something that we haven't touched on yet that I think is important for people who are thinking about going to the show. Um, talk to me a little bit about the workshops that, uh, that, that Macworld does because this is – uh, some really in-depth stuff that, uh, that that people are learning. These are full-day workshops that that uh, that will help people master whatever it is that uh, they're interested in doing. And I'd like to hear a, a little bit more about what you think of those. Absolutely. So what we do is the show is the March 27th to 29th, which is a Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But on Wednesday, while we're still kind of setting up the exhibit hall, we use the meeting rooms for these full-day, deep-dive, in-depth workshops. So these are one day. Um, most of them are one instructor, um, and there are anywhere from 50 to 200 people who attend uh, these courses, um, but they're of topics that are of particular interest. So just to touch on a couple of the great ones that we have this year, we have a full-day workshop that Jack Hollingsworth and um, Dan Marcolina are doing on iPhoneography. The, 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 the art and science of taking great pictures with your iPhone is exploding into kind of a semi-professional realm now. Uh, and these two guys have you know, published books on it, and they do classes all around the world. They're doing a full-day class to give people everything they need to know about using your iPhone as a, as a semi-professional to professional uh, camera. And it's great. We did it last year. It was you know, tremendously well received. Um, you'll learn about a lot of products that you wouldn't have known about and see how they get put to, to work. And you'll learn, about, again, the art and science of taking pictures with your, with your uh, iPhone or iPad. So that's kind of a cool one. Chris Breen is doing a session that is uh, selling really, really well. That is the iPad in business. There's a lot of talk about how the iPad is a tool for small business. Chris is going to go deeper into this for a full day and talk about all the different ways and show examples, everything, you know, point of sale, uh, you know, marketing, you know, everything that the iPad can do in the realm of being a, a useful tool in a small business. So that's a great one. Um, Keynote has had a major um, um, overhaul, and a lot of people use Keynote in their presentations instead of PowerPoint now. And the use of the new Keynote um, is of particular interest to people that deserved a full day. So that's one of the Apple products uh, that, you know, we're, we touch on all the Apple products over the course of the show. iOS 7, Mavericks, uh, all the iLife products, and all the iWork products have some place in the show where you'll get some tips and techniques. But Keynote is one that has enough new features that we thought it deserved uh, going into a full day. So that's three of them. There are technical ones for IT admins that are you know, maybe beyond the scope of this conversation, but I encourage people to look on the website. Those are very valuable. Like I said, deep dive. Your brain will hurt when you walk out of them, but you will learn quite a bit. And uh, how does pricing work? Is Can you come for a day? Do you have to come for the whole week? Can you come for a workshop? Can you get everything? Is there an advantage to signing up early? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, I got these numbers right in front of me. Um, right now, um, the cost to go to the expo only, and on the expo floor, remember, there'll be, the, you know, like I said, 150 app developers and all the other products. We have two stages on the expo floor, one called the Macworld Live stage where there's a bunch of podcast interviews and things going on, and then a second stage where there'll be performances and a lot of other things that are going on as well. Uh, right now, it's $25. If you walk up at the door, it's $30, so you can save $5 by registering early. Um, and then for the conference, which is normally $349, up until February 28th, it's $249. And I actually, if you give me a second, I want to pull up something. I have um, a special offer that I want to do for you guys. Is that all right? Oh, awesome. If we do the code K as in killer, H as in hill, 89Q9, and that's just for uh, 
for, for the iMore podcast. We got a great deal. $10 for an Expo Hall pass and $149 for a conference pass. That's the full two-and-a-half-day conference. So, so $100 wow. off of our already discounted price, but it's going to be 48 hours only. So you tell me when this goes live, and that code will be good for 48 hours. That is fantastic, Paul. Thank you. On behalf of the iMore readership and viewership, I thank you. <laughs> I hope a lot of people take advantage of it. We want to see as many people there as possible. So, Paul, um, I know you have to run. I appreciate your time. If people want to find out more about Macworld and iWorld, where can they go? MacworldIWorld.com. You can also follow us at, um, on Twitter, and you can also check out our Facebook page. And if people are interested in you, maybe where you're playing your gigs, are you on Twitter as well? Uh, yeah, so we didn't talk about my, my budding career as a rock star, as an aging rock star, <laughs> as an aged rock star. But um, yeah, you know, I play with the Macworld All-Star Band with a bunch of our friends from the Apple industry. Uh, we'll be playing at that Mac 30th uh, celebration that's going on in Cupertino, um, it, and that's kind of cool. So if you're for the Mac 30th, if you're in California, if you want to fly in for that one. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, if you want to check out what I do when I'm here in, in Silicon Valley, uh, SV, like Silicon Valley, houserockers.com, or find the House Rockers on Facebook and come out and see me play guitar and say hi. And you're at Paul Kent? At Paul Kent, that's right. Awesome. Paul, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Totally my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Great to see you guys both again. And Peter, a pleasure as always. Thank you, Renee. Likewise. All right, and thank you, everyone, for watching. Uh, we'll have more. We're going to be covering Macworld up to the show, during the show, and after the show. So keep it locked to imore.com. <laughs>